佛教兴盛于世，近二十五个世纪，佛陀仁慈的教义、悲悯的大爱，促进了人类的发展，特别是在教育、正义、民主、和平等方面。卫赛节是纪念佛教导师释迦牟尼佛诞生、成道和涅槃的重要节日。两千零六年十月，法国巴黎联合国教科文组织总部与泰国驻联合国教科文组织代表、世界佛教学人、世界佛教大学、澳洲净宗学院。联合举办欢庆二五五零年卫赛节，这次节庆以专题演讲、座谈会、展览、影片播放等多元活动方式，以达多方交流，希望传承佛教的团结合作、社会责任、和平使命。在开幕仪式中，各国高僧大德、国际组织贵宾、政府领导和各界人士，先起立向佛陀致敬，揭开序幕。接着由新加坡九大宗教代表，手牵着手，至诚地为世界和平祈祷。办单位及重要贵宾分别上台致辞，希望把和平的讯息传播到世界每一个角落。One of the outstanding forces of Buddhism, as both religion and philosophy, is its ability to act as a catalyst. Enabling different societies to give expression to their latent qualities and creative energy, Buddhism's extraordinary capacity to integrate, transmit, and fertilize many cultures constitutes the living proof of the Buddha's message: unity in diversity. This resonates. Strongly with UNESCO's notion of cultural diversity, this notion recognizes the common links between societies while acknowledging their distinctive identities as factors of richness and openness in an increasingly globalized world. Buddhism advocates the need to be at peace with oneself in order to be able to open up to others. And to fully accept and recognize the diverse identities that make up the fabric of our shared humanity, such introspection does not imply isolation within one's own world and thoughts. Rather, it suggests an ever-evolving exchange with others of living and thinking. Motivated by a true spirit of knowledge of the other, in the current international climate, marked by increasing intercultural and interreligious tensions, this celebration offers an excellent opportunity to give worldwide resonance to the Buddha's message of mutual respect and dialogue. UNESCO views dialogue as an effective means of avoiding the misunderstandings that reinforce negative stereotypes, breed antagonism and mistrust, and pave the way for violence. By allowing different perspectives and critical views to emerge, dialogue can help us to gain a better understanding. Of other cultures and religions, as well as our own, there can be no doubt that the quest for peace can only come through the mutual understanding of and respect for 
different faith in the spirit of the UNESCO Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity adopted in 2001. It is UNESCO's constitutional mandate to advance the mutual knowledge and understanding of peoples. The organization attaches great importance to inter-religious dialogue as a means of strengthening relationships within and between societies. The organization is deeply committed not only to fostering dialogue, but also to building new partnerships for interface cooperation. I am also pleased to welcome the Buddhist leaders of the host organizations, namely His Excellency Pan Vanamati, President of the World Fellowship of Buddhists, Most Venerable uh, Chinku, President of the Pure Learning College of Australia, and Professor Naranis said to Bud, the director of the World Buddhist University, for their joint cooperation to host these historical events, wishing to acknowledge the Buddhist contribution to world peace and sustainable development. It is also my privilege to welcome both Buddhist and other member states to UNESCO for their kind cooperation to make a success of this event. I also equally welcome the Buddhist dignitaries, monks and nuns, invited speakers, as well as delegates who are coming from around the world to celebrate these Buddhist golden jubilees at UNESCO and to pay tribute deeply grateful to the Lord Buddha. It is worthy to note that after 25 centuries existence of these noble religions, the Buddhism today has become a universal religion and philosophy which is playing an important role in different areas of human development. The peace has been touched by the Lord Buddha as main concept of his teachings. For him, without development peace, first one's own inner heart, it is impossible to create world peace. Therefore, practicing of Buddhism as individual's capacity will help to create peace in the society. The Buddha's activity in the 6th century BCE correspond to the time of the Socrates in Greece and Confucius in China, and it was a period of enlightenment which heralded the beginning of the humanism. Ladies and gentlemen, during these three days of celebration at UNESCO, there would be a series of activities has been planned to enrich this historical event. Among them, two keynote speeches will highlight how and which manner Buddhism has been influenced to humanity as well as to maintain sustainable development of world peace. Besides that, there would be two panel discussions. The first panel will focus that how Buddhism has been contributed in education in education, spiritual, ethical, and humanistic progress since it is in steps. And the second will be an intercultural dialogue, which will aim how dialogue can dialogue and openness will eliminate mistrust, misunderstanding, and intolerance among different traditions and to find out the role of religion for peace building. Therefore, I strongly believe that the philosophy of the Buddha may contribute a lot to UNESCO sectors of culture and education in its program of dialogue among civilization, philosophy, peace and human rights education, which seem to be missing in the activities.
Mr. President, the world nation today face many problems, among them insecurity, become a deadly a universal curse, both among the rich and the poor. The highly developed science and technology has failed to find out the secret of human happiness. Therefore, I believe that during these three days of discussions, we may find out a roadmap in the light of the Buddha's teaching to create a better world where all human beings would enjoy peace and serenity. الزملاء منظمي هذا الاحتفال الكبير العلماء رجال الدين الأساتذة سيداتي سادتي إننا اليوم وفي هذا اللقاء التاريخي الكبير الذي نتذكر فيه رجل عظيم وهب حياته من أجل الإنسانية ذكرى 2550 سنة على ميلادي ليان هوكو جاو كو ون زو تردي ميشو دا ليان هوكو جاو 祝法国的大使尊敬的九大宗教的代表们来自世界各地的专家学者诸位女士们先生这一次非常荣幸澳洲金宗学院应联合国教科文组织的邀请与法国大使共同举办热烈庆祝两千五百五十年的未才结的活动来自全球许许多多的国家代表贵宾们齐聚一堂探讨佛教对人类的贡献金空在此地至最诚挚的欢迎金空从无数五年的学习当中深深地体会到佛教是佛陀对一切众生至善圆满的教育释迦牟尼佛是古代的多元文化的社会教育家同时也是多元文化的社会教育义务工作者两千五百多年来无数的高僧大德善男信女接受如此圆满智慧教育为主修的课程潜移默化自行化他为幸福美满社会安定世界和平做出伟大的贡献佛法圆融的慈悲智慧提升了人们心灵的层次高度的善巧方便丰富了人们文化艺术特别在东方的历史产生了深远广大的影响它与中国五千年文化水乳交融和传统伦理道德因果智慧科学教育相得益彰而在今天这样天灾人祸频繁的时代当中真正力行实践学佛者必定是从自己内心化解对一切人事物的对立疑虑做起进而呢化解社会诸多的冲突矛盾实践爱心变世界善意满人间的世界一家幸福人生和谐社会实际上不仅佛法世界上所有宗教神圣的伦理道德教育都能引导我们走向和谐光明这几天的活动当中我们也会将这些年来努力所做的成果以及在中国汤池小镇的
以释迦牟尼佛办班教学的方式，推动和谐社会这个实验的效果，向大会来做报告，尽情指教，并祝大会圆满成功。各位嘉宾，身心愉快，吉祥如意，谢谢。I would like to thank you for inviting me to this opening session of celebration of 2,550th anniversary of Buddha Sikya Muni Gautama. It is not only an honor for me, but also a great pleasure to have this opportunity to be together with you, to listening to you. I should like to extend to you the warmest greetings on behalf of the Executive Board of UNESCO, and I also like to express my sincere thanks, great appreciation to all of you, the leaders of the religions of the world, for your contribution for the. Inter-religion and the intercultural dialogue, for your contribution to build the peace through this kind of cultural and religious exchange, this is so important and so urgently needed. So, based on that, I must thank you and give you a salute. From the Prime Minister of Australia, John Howard. The message begins. It gives me great pleasure to provide this message on the occasion of the conference at UNESCO in Paris from 7 to 9 October 2006 to celebrate the 2,550th anniversary of the birth of Buddha. This conference provides an excellent opportunity for Buddhists and scholars of Buddhism. To join together to consider the profound influence that Buddhism has had globally, both historically and in more recent times, I am particularly pleased to learn that Australian Buddhists have contributed to the development and presentation of the conference under the leadership of the Venerable Master Jin Kung A M, Vice Chancellor of Pure Land Learning College in Toowoomba, Queensland. Australia is a peaceful. Harmonious and inclusive nation that respects the rights of citizens to maintain and develop their cultural and religious beliefs in an Australian context. The Buddhist community is held in high regard in Australia, due to its long-standing commitment to strengthening community relations through the promotion of interfaith understanding. I send greetings of peace. And goodwill to all those attending the conference. Prime Minister of Australia, John Howard. Thank you. 来自柬埔寨、中国、印度、日本、韩国、辽国、缅甸、尼泊尔、斯里兰卡、泰国、越南等十一个国家的联合国教科文组织代表。分别为了这次历史性的联合国教科文组织的宗教活动致辞。Buddhism in the world today. In the royal park of Lumbini in northern Nepal, to the north of India, the Buddha was born in the sixth century B.C.E. The ancient Buddhist chronicles record the day of his birth as a full moon day in the month of May. It is a special day in human history. 
commemorating an extraordinary human being who appeared on this planet Earth to save millions of human lives from misery and suffering, and to guide the intellectual and cultural development of humanity for millennia. His father, King Sudodana, ruled over the Shakyas at Kapilavastu, and his mother, Queen Maya, hailed from the neighboring principality of Devadaha. The prince Siddhartha Gautama, the future Buddha, was brought up in luxury as befitting his royal birth. He was given a traditional education, preparing him to succeed his father to the throne. In addition, his doting father took special care to ensure that the young prince was prevented from encountering any form of misery or unhappiness in life. It was in deference to a prediction that he would become a great spiritual figure if he ever renounced lay life. He married Princess Yasodhara at the age of 16 and in 13 years was due to have their first baby. Assured that his commitment to family life was firm by this time, he was allowed to move freely outside the citadel. During these outings, he came across an old man, a sick person, a dead body, and an ascetic. His first ever encounter with the realities of life. Thus, being suddenly made aware of the inevitability of old age, disease, and death, the young prince was deeply concerned with the impermanence of existence and the resulting misery and suffering. He was determined to find for himself a way to save humanity from suffering. He left his palace on the very day of the birth of his son Rahula and set out on a quest for answers on how to end human suffering. Renouncing royal robes and donning rags of a mendicant ascetic, he wandered into the forest in search of teachers. None of the teachers from whom he learned advanced techniques on meditation for mental development could lead him to his goal of finding an end to suffering. Then he embarked on his own effort, practicing the most arduous penances with long periods of fasting. The more rigorous his practice of self-mortification, the weaker he became physically and distraught in mind. But impressed by his determination, five ascetics tended him in his most excruciating practices. Soon the princely ascetic realized the futility of self-mortification and decided to adopt the middle path of avoiding both extremes of self-indulgence and self-torture. As he grew in strength and mental stability, his five attending ascetics abandoned him. Alone, he proceeded with his efforts and at the age of 35 attained full enlightenment. Under the Bodhi tree, in Bodh Gaya in India. Thus he achieved the status of a Buddha, a fully awakened or enlightened sage, and a teacher of men and gods. He went in search of the five attending ascetics and delivered to them at Isipatana in modern Sarnath near Varanasi the first discourse, aptly designated the rolling of the wheel of doctrine. In his teachings, he analyzed the reality of human existence as comprising impermanence and perpetual change, causing unsatisfactoriness and misery, and thereby underscoring the futility of the notion of self. He presented the four noble truths of suffering to be realized 
the cause of suffering, which is craving that had to be eradicated, the end of suffering in Nibbana to be attained, and the Noble Eightfold Path to be practiced. His systematic process of mental development led the practitioner to the attainment of self-realization and enlightenment through virtue and moral purity, mindfulness, and concentration of the mind. This was taught to those who opted to follow his path of deliverance. To the laity, he taught a path of moral purity, leading to a better life here and hereafter. The Buddha had as much to say on life here and now as on spiritual progress to salvation. Standing before humans as a human, with no claim to divine or supernatural power or connection, the Buddha taught a path which every man, woman, or child could follow, and presented an ideal of perfection which was within everyone's reach to be attained with nothing but one's own effort and determination. One is one's own master, was his clarion call to humanity. One has to attain one's salvation by one's own effort, for the Buddhas were only the pointers to the path. He relied on the critical acumen of all people and placed even his own teachings for examination with the invitation, Ehi Pasiko, come and see for yourself. Think for yourself, he underscored, and let the good and benefit of the many be the only criterion. His way of life had no place for dogma or blind faith. He recognized the multiplicity of spiritual paths and studiously avoided the slightest inclination to conversion. He believed that all religious teachers could lead their disciples to heaven and enjoin them to do so. Founding the Sangha as a self-renewing, self-sustaining democratic society of dedicated men and women, submitting to a stringent code of discipline of restraint and selfless service, the Buddha initiated the earliest known missionary movements in the world. Go forth on missions, O monastics, for the good and the benefit of the many. He enjoined the Sangha, and it has remained for over 2,600 years an extraordinarily effective spiritual movement and force. The missionary zeal of the Sangha is as strong today as it has been in its long and peaceful history. Neither a central authority nor organizational control was ever established. The Buddha agitated against the prevailing caste system of India, where people were occupationally and socially compelled by birth to rigid restrictions and hardships. To emphasize the equality of all humans, he set the example of admitting to the Sangha candidates from all castes and classes and established seniority of membership as the only standard of precedence. Similarly, he recognized the intellectual and spiritual potential of women and enabled them to be active members of the Sangha. In his numerous discourses on life issues, he upheld for every person the right to education, the right to work, the right to freedom, and the right to choose a religion. With precept and example as his principal tools of agitation and public education, he led an effective movement against all forms of social barriers and discrimination, intolerance and prejudice, exploitation and oppression. 
declaring that all sentient creatures feared violence as life was precious to every being, the Buddha advocated non-violence. He urged for peace and reconciliation, understanding and accommodation, moderation and forgiveness. To his relatives who were about to start a war over a water dispute, he asked, what is more valuable, a drop of blood or water? The five disciplines of avoiding killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, falsehood, and abuse of liquor and drugs were advocated for all as a minimum moral code to ensure order and well-being. The Buddhist ideal of life was couched in the four sublime or imponderable states of loving-kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. The goal of spiritual training was the realization of wisdom through mental development based on moral purity. The Buddha's mission lasted 45 years until he passed away at the age of 80 years at Kusinara. By this time, he had set the foundation for his teachings to be compiled, codified, and systematically studied. The Sangha had become a full-pledged educational organization with an enormous capacity to preserve and spread the Buddhist teachings through instruction as well as substantial literary efforts of explanation and interpretation. A religious infrastructure in the form of well-established monasteries and shrines had also come into being. Thus, 2,550 years ago, the mission of the Buddha was fully consolidated to become the world religion it has now become. What for nearly 300 years remained a regional religion was spread over the then known Eurasian world by the Mauryan Emperor Asoka. Nine missions sent under his patronage took Buddhism to Sri Lanka, Myanmar and Thailand, as well as to other parts of the Indian subcontinent and the Greek dominions to the west. Three centuries later, Kushan King Kanishka I facilitated the spread of Buddhism via the Silk Routes to Central Asia from where it went in due course to China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. Buddhism has consolidated itself into three major traditions as Theravada or Southern Buddhism in South and Southeast Asia, Mahayana or Northern Buddhism in East Asia, and Vajrayana or Tantrayana Buddhism in Tibet, Mongolia, and Russia. Preserving intact the central teachings of the Buddha, these traditions and their schools and sects cater for the specific spiritual requirements of nearly half a billion of the world's population. The most spectacular element of Buddhism is its rich and varied cultural heritage, representing significant achievements in literature, art and architecture, and performing arts. The aesthetic creativity inspired by Buddhism is best displayed by such great monuments as Buddha Gaya, Sanchi, Ajanta, and Elara in India, Anuradhapura, Polonarawa, Sigiriya, Maligawila, Dambula, and Kandi in Sri Lanka, Taksila and takht e bahai in Pakistan, Bamiyan and Bagram in Afghanistan, Dunhuang, Luoyang, Le Sham and Xi'an in China, Borobudur in Indonesia, Angkor Wat and Bayan in Cambodia, Nara, Kyoto and Kamakura in Japan, 
Sakuram in Korea, Hue in Vietnam, Shue Dagon and Mandalay in Myanmar, and Ayutthaya and Chiang Mai in Thailand. Equally impressive are the numerous objects of art, especially statues of the Buddha and Bodhisattvas, illustrated manuscripts of Buddhist scriptures, sculptures depicting the life of the Buddha and history of Buddhism, and diverse decorative motifs, which are treasured in many museums on all continents. Buddhism remains the vibrant spiritual force of Asia where most of the countries have a majority of Buddhists. With the European expansion into Asia, Buddhism was discovered by missionaries and scholars who over the last 200 years have contributed to the evolution of Buddhist studies as a major intellectual discipline. From the nursery of the academia, Buddhism has progressively moved to Western society, where an increasing population of admirers and friends of Buddhism pursue both study and practice. Buddhist meditation and chanting have become popular pursuits in their circles. The rapidly increasing Buddhist communities in Europe Northern and Southern America and Australia, resulting from the recent diaspora from traditionally Buddhist countries, have added diversity and spiritual enrichment to Western societies. The sheer number of annual publications of books and periodicals on Buddhism in Western languages is an indication of the growing interest in the teachings of the Buddha and their application to problems and challenges of the modern world. Increasingly recognized is the contribution which Buddhism is capable of making to combat violence and insecurity, intolerance and prejudice, and war and criminality in a concerted universal effort to restore peace, harmony, and human dignity. The Buddhists are conscious of their responsibility to mobilize themselves to enable Buddhism to serve humanity. They have established international organizations to serve this purpose. Among them, the World Fellowship of Buddhists in Bangkok, which enjoys operational relations with UNESCO, the World Buddhist University, and Pure Land Learning College in Australia are noteworthy. In all, many hundreds of organizations work regionally and nationally to promote human development through the teachings of the Buddha, which in summary are Sabha Papasa Akaranam, Kusalasa Upasampada, Sasita Pariyodapanam Etam Buddha Nusasanam. Zai Kaimo Dini Shang, Gaji Gausan Dabur. 国际组织贵宾、政府领导和各界人士对这次活动的意义与期许发表演讲。我国就是召开和平会议，啊，从一九七零年到现在也三十多年，这世界的。这个冲突的频率年年上升，啊，我参加了五次这个会议，会后我们跟这些专家学者们聊天，大家都对于和平丧失的信心，啊，这个问题非常严重
啊，为什么上失去信心？会议的结论都很好，啊，交给联合国了。联合国相信也分发给许多国家做参考。哪一个国家能落实呢？啊，没有国家了。会听联合国的话，劝导啊！啊，所以，我提我也做了几次主题讲演，啊，那么大众都说法师，啊，你讲的很好，你的意见很好，可是做不到啊！啊，谁肯去做呢？因此，我们才在中国汤池做了一个实验。用中国传统的方法，啊，中国五千年，你像这么大的国家，这么多的族群，啊，能够啊，长时间维系着和睦相处、平等对待，啊，许多专家学者认为这是奇迹，啊，不可能的事情呢，中国人为什么做到？所以我们就想到中国古人的方法，不是用开会，也不是用镇压，也不是用报复，用什么呢？用教学，啊，办办教学，这个方法成功了。所以我们就用这个方法呢，在中国找一个小镇做一个实验，啊，没有想到啊，这个实验呢，出乎我意料之外的。成功了，啊！我们原先以为要用三年的时间，啊，来教学，没有想到，不到一年，啊，我们的实验从去年十一月开始，今年现在十月，啊，在一年的时间呢，收到非常殊胜的效果，啊，我们新加坡九九大宗教像兄弟姐妹一样，一家人，可以团结。那么，人民是可以教的好的，啊，只要你肯教，啊，以伦理、道德、因果、智慧、科学，好好的来教，啊，要把恶人变成善人，啊，把坏人变成好人，把迷惑的人变成聪明人，啊，把愚痴的人变成智慧的人，把凡人变成圣人。变成佛菩萨，教学就成功了，啊！所以我们做这个，通过这个试验，啊，我们就有了信心，啊！所以，人民确实能够啊教得好的啊。在第一天的活动中，有法宝法师主持佛教专家论坛，以佛教徒对人类文化与发展的贡献为主题。邀请到德国菲利普大学教授帕沙迪加教授、法国硕本大学教授雪尼特教授、泰国马哈蒙科国际禅坐中心庞克法师、法国梅村中心主任蒂拿汉法师、法国国家科学研究议会主任巴加哈瑞教授。以及澳洲格里菲斯大学多元宗教中心杜水新教授发表自身的研究与论述。来自美国加州西来大学院长普鲁奇教授，以佛教徒对世界的贡献为题发表演讲。普鲁奇教授叙述释迦牟尼一生以苦恨、放弃人性的贪念化导他的弟子。以戒为师，以苦为师，修身为本，教学为先。释迦牟尼佛为我们做出了最好的典范。以宗教在世界和平的角色为主题的佛教专家论坛，由古鲁奇教授主持，澳洲净宗学院副院长悟行法师。意大利梵蒂冈驻教科文机构永久观察人富罗牧师，澳洲纽西兰犹太教议会主席尤利德莫牧师 ，ICOM 荣誉会员席德阿曼巴格里，以及马来西亚永乐学习中心
永乐多斯博士在论坛中发言，讨论历史上宗教对于世界和平的影响。庐江文化教育中心教务主任蔡礼旭老师及树永东先生、李义多律师、钟茂森博士。以中国安徽省的汤池镇镇民学习《弟子规》的体验，深刻阐述：和谐世界，从我心做起，从我家做起，从我村做起，从我镇做起的真实意。净空老教授为了使世人能认识佛陀教育及因果伦理教育，因此赠送《大藏经》《十王图》《孔子圣迹图》给与会贵宾。Thank you all for attending this conference. We now present to you a simple but formal gift presentation ceremony. Before it begins, let us spend a moment to understand what these gifts could mean in the long term. Around 600 BC, a baby boy was born. He grew up to be a teacher who enlightened the minds of people in this world. We call him a Buddha. He pointed out to us a way to be free from suffering and to reach for happiness. He not only influenced the people of India, but his teachings transcended time and space, and continue to impact even on people today. Shakyamuni Buddha deeply felt the afflictions and the pain suffered in this world. In order to find a way out, he led an ascetic life and tried to learn the way. Under a Bodhi tree, he attained enlightenment. He realized that only education could help sentient beings to become awakened. During his lifetime, Shakyamuni Buddha worked as a multicultural social worker for 49 years. After he entered Nirvana, his disciples put his teachings into written words to ensure they would be passed on to the later generations and be the basis of their learning and practice. Later, people systematically compiled all the Buddha scriptures into a book called the Great Buddha's Canon. The Qing Dynasty's Qianlong edition. Is the only edition compiled and printed by a royal household, known historically as Longzang. The engraved edition stands 40 stories high when folded, and is a very unusual spectacle. The Longzang contains 1,675 Buddhist scriptures. Their topics include philosophy, history. Cultural study, language, literature, poetry, astrology, medicine, architecture, and many other topics. It could well be called the world encyclopedia of civilization. The Pure Land Learning College, using the modern printing technology, reproduced 121 sets of Longzang. For wide circulation, ensuring that even after 2,550 years, people can still have access to Buddhist teachings. Under the current increasingly complicated world situation, the important multicultural educational Buddhist canon, the Longzang, can become the basis of solving the problems of humankind by promoting the security. And the harmony of our world. Confucius was born in 551 BC, around the same time as Shakyamuni Buddha. He was the first person in Chinese history to advocate free public education for all. 
People call him the most accomplished and the most sacred teacher. The goal of Confucian teachings aimed for a state of utopia and a nation based on proper etiquette and fairness. He was once a county magistrate of Lu. After only one year on this job, he was able to improve the county's old established practice. In his later years, Confucius returned to his homeland and dedicated his life to teaching. He taught people to abide by the teachings of proper etiquette and music, to be fully developed. In their capabilities for the benefit of the people. Throughout his life, Confucius was never bored with learning or teaching. After he passed away, his students mourned him for three years, as if he was their father. The original painting of the sacred footprints of Confucius is 42.8 centimeters high and 2,850 centimeters long. It was painted by the well-known artist Mr. Jiang Yizi. The picture consists of a series of 32 separate paintings, describing some of the most important subjects of Confucian teachings and deeds in Confucius' life. Attached behind the painting is a picture of the Ten Wisdoms, demonstrating how Confucius' disciples put his teachings into practice. The next gift is the painting of the changing forms of hell. In recent years, there have been frequent, devastating man-made and natural disasters and catastrophes. They are mostly because we have neglected the teachings of the sages, and because we no longer believe in the law of cause and effect. Most religions have stories about the images of hell. The function of hell is not to frighten people, but to offer a much deeper meaning and to educate people about the law of cause and effect. The changing images of hell caught on canvas are realistic and have a deep and long-term impact on people, stopping them from having any more evil thoughts or doing any more evil deeds. This far-reaching effect. Is what an education about the law of cause and effect has on people. We justly receive what we deserve, according to our karma. The innumerable changing forms of hell are merely the reflections of the ever-changing minds and deeds that are evil. Buddha repeatedly pointed out in the scriptures that it is very difficult to be born a human. And to come into contact with Buddha's teachings, therefore we must abide by his teachings before we can be free from the cycle of rebirth. Our environment changes according to the changes in our minds. Therefore, we have heaven and hell. The moment we turn back from our evil ways, we find ourselves in the world of the ultimate bliss. The painting of the changing forms of hell is 70 centimeters high and 6,000 centimeters long. The Pure Land Learning College has reproduced many copies, giving them away to various museums, universities, and centers for circulation and exhibition, hoping when the sentient beings see the paintings, they will become enlightened. The three gifts. The changing forms of hell, the sacred footprints of Confucius and Longzheng, all teach us to be dutiful children, to serve our teachers, to abstain from killing, and to cultivate the ten virtuous conducts. They are the basic elements required to be human, and the foundation of becoming a Buddha. While we warmly celebrate Vesak, we hope all Buddhists. Regardless of nationality and race, get along peacefully and in harmony, and treat each other equally. World harmony stems from our minds. Let us learn from Shakyamuni Buddha, and in his spirit, give classes and teach with the purpose of resolving conflicts.
helping to stabilize our society and keeping our world at peace. With your blessing and goodwill, we are certain that this conference will turn out to be a truly successful one. Thank you. Human beginning, human end. Human close, human far. 苟不教，性乃迁。在淳朴中遇见自己，和谐世界从新开始。大自然充满了各种声音，因为和谐共存。所以与本性共鸣。中国安徽省庐江县汤池镇，山水灵秀，人们纯净纯善的眼神，朴实的生活，深刻触动了净空老教授。这位一生追求和谐的忍者，希望从自己的家乡。落实教育工作，因此创建了庐江文化教育中心，致力恢复中国传统文化，建构和谐社会。心境，国土境；心安，众生安；心平，天下平。庐江文化教育中心。中心每周一都有镇民来参加升旗仪式。聆听演讲，接受爱国主义教育。积极创建汤池和谐社会示范镇，是汤池政府、人民和中心老师共同的心愿。汤池镇政府领导也前来参加升旗。我是一块砖，哪里需要，哪里搬。为了共同的理念，中心老师以“舍小家为大家”的奉献精神，汇聚在这里生活培训。迎着晨曦练太极健身，认真上课，勤学才艺，亲近大地。我是一块砖，哪里需要哪里搬，是中心老师无私的座右铭。下乡、入户、入校讲课，一步一脚印的实践，学习不分区域，讲课不分日夜，教育不分季节。在镇政府的鼎力支持下，中心老师以无比的爱心，教导村民从生活中落实《弟子规》。现在
孝顺爱敬的事迹频频传扬。传承孝亲家风，创造幸福晚年。为了让所有镇民有学习传统文化的好地方，成立了镇民学校，开办才艺班。免费开放给所有镇民。乡亲在这里学习编织、吹奏民乐、唱歌跳舞，在寓教于乐中传承孝亲家风，创造幸福的晚年。没有围墙的绿色教室。男女老幼欢乐学习，风景优美的马槽河畔树林间，中心与乡亲们共同建立一所没有围墙的绿色教室。乡亲无论男女老少，都可以在大自然中自由的学习圣贤文化和唱出生命的希望。倡导仁爱良善民风，实际行动回馈乡亲。为倡导仁爱良善的民风，镇政府与中心联合举办各项活动，例如各类茶话会。送温暖给老人，表扬好婆婆、好媳妇儿、好爸爸、好儿童，模范劳动者，以启发大家敬老尊贤的善念，并以实际行动回馈乡里，举凡造桥、设置垃圾桶。现金捐助等，有激发爱心义行的善导作用。来自各行、各地、各国，聆听幸福人生讲座。幸福人生讲座是中心对外教学课程。面向社会不同团体，有教育系统、企业人员、政府部门、海外友人参访团、大学生班、亲情班等等。讲授传统文化在现实生活各个领域的落实与应用。中心老师以《弟子规》的德行规范，讲述来自于生活的体验和实力，让学员那颗蒙尘的心透出本质的光亮，回归人性的真善美。中心传扬圣贤教育的成果广受肯定，希望将中华传统文化推广到世界各地。责任的承担是成长的开始。人之初，性本善。
，善是可经启发的。二零零六年五月开始，海口监狱在庐江中心教学的启发下，将传统文化带入服刑人员的教育中。民警和老师们以身作则，率先落实《弟子规》，通过多样的教学形式，使服刑人员学会了虚心反省、心怀感恩，生活在感恩的世界。社会、国家本来就是一体，衣食住行无一不包含众人的付出与成就。一粥一饭，当思来处不易；半丝半缕，恒念物力维艰。中心老师每天都生活在感恩的世界，并把这份感恩之情灌注在弘扬传统文化的工作中。以真诚爱心培育，农作收成更丰硕。不仅人与人可以和谐共存，人与天地万物也是和谐共融的。中心老师按传统农业的耕种方式。不加农药，不施化肥，用真诚爱心种出了一片有机的绿色菜园。纯净、纯善，心系祖国，胸怀世界，追求和平。庐江文化教育中心。从人与人的相处，到人与自然的互动中，真诚地落实、传承、发扬圣贤教育，影响的波纹正逐渐向外扩展。二零零六年十月，巴黎联合国教科文组织的国际会议中，净空老教授。介绍庐江的教学成果，希望世人共同追求社会安定、世界和平。驻足庐江，听见自然和谐的声音，在淳朴中遇见真实的自己，从自己内心开始寻求和谐。这将是和谐家庭、和谐社会、和谐世界最大的原动力。感恩您的聆听、观赏。佛教徒若能落实佛陀教育，则能达国土净、众生安、天下平的目标。毗卢遮那佛、文殊菩萨、普贤菩萨，象征行者于苦难的娑婆世界中修学，而完成大恨与大智的圆满世界。阿弥陀是无量智慧、无量福德。无量寿命的意思，佛是智慧觉悟的意思。会场有近七百公分高的柱子，挂有不同宗教教义的大福墨宝，祈求世人能不分国界、不分种族、不分宗教，都应该平等对待、和睦相处。这次展览以佛陀十二相成道说明佛陀一生的经历。借此明了凡夫如何转凡成圣。佛陀一生从事于义务教学，教导我们破迷开悟，离苦得乐
，认识宇宙人生的真相。为了使佛陀教育普及化，善用网际网路及卫星电视教学，学习者可以不受时空的限制，因材受教。至圣先师孔子修订六经，广兴教化。孔子圣基图。呈现至圣先师孔子一生的事迹，说明孔子有教无类的精神，以及仁孝礼义的思想内容。地狱变相图有它深层的因果教育意义。地狱变相造型栩栩如生，历历在目，影响世人深远，以至于一生中能诸恶莫作，众善奉行。一群年约十多岁的庐江文化教育中心专科班的小朋友，一刀刀展现出中华文化的坚实之美。庐江文化教育中心致力恢复中华传统伦理道德教育，并且以修身为本、教学为先，其能建构为一个和谐社会的示范标杆。以巴黎铁塔及本次活动主题为背景的拍照区，提供与会者拍照纪念。这次活动的和谐氛围，诚如泰国副大使所说，是联合国教科文组织举办的活动中前所未有的美好景象。华严经云：“一切众生皆有如来智慧德相，但以妄想执着而不能正德。”圆觉经说：“一切众生本来成佛，一切众生本来是佛。”这些道理总令人觉得深奥难懂。佛、菩萨、阿罗汉，乃至一切神圣，对我们而言，总是如此高不可攀。其实，佛经所说的，都是宇宙人生的真相，是我们每个人的本来面目。佛陀，只是教人转恶为善。转迷为悟，转祸为福，转灾凶为吉祥，转烦恼为菩提，转生死为涅槃，回归自性，本来是佛。关键就在迷悟之间，自己是否真正的看破放下？现在，让我们来看看下面的短片，为大家揭示宇宙生命的真实意。白色代表自信，黄色代表妄想，蓝色代表分别，红色代表执着。自信是不生不灭、不来不去、不长不断、不依不异、变法界、虚空界，无时不在、无处不在。虽然空无所有，能生一切万法，是宇宙万物生命的根源，也是哲学所说的。宇宙的本体，妄想、分别、执着，是由一念无名而升起，是自性本来没有的。心经云：“照见五蕴皆空，度一切苦厄。”一切众生本来是佛。
，自信圆满具足，一切智慧、福德、才艺相好。自信又称为法性、本性或者心性，也就是《三字经》所说的“人之初，性本善”。但因一念不觉，而生无名。无名就是妄想，就是起心动念。起心动念就是迷，迷得更深，升起了分别，迷上加迷，从分别再产生执着。依执着的深浅不同，而分为天、人、阿修罗、畜生、恶鬼、地狱六道。实际上，本觉本有，不觉本无。本觉是本性本善，不觉是妄想、分别。执着，无论妄想、分别、执着多么深重，一切众生的本性本善从未失去，不生不灭。既然妄想、分别、执着是自性本来没有的，当然可以去除。自信是一切众生本有的，肯定可以恢复。佛陀把这宇宙生命的真实相说出来，让我们从此建立坚定的信心，相信凡夫决定可以成佛，毫无疑惑。凡夫于事出事法，有妄想，有分别，有执着。阿罗汉有妄想，有分别，无执着。菩萨有妄想，无分别，无执着。诸佛如来一切皆无，明心见性。自性本具的圆满智慧德相，一时顿现。是故佛教众生，若能看破，烦恼迷惑本无，放下执着、分别、妄想，本来成佛，本来是佛，真正觉悟，一切境界是法相。现前的身体就是法身，所有的善恶、是非、美丑、好坏，都是自己的妄想、分别、执着，绝不妨碍自信，也跟一切境界毫无关系。好比我们戴上有色眼镜，看到一切境界。都被扭曲了。只有摘下眼镜，才能看到事实真相。眼镜，就好比我们的妄想、分别、执着。所以《楞严经》说：“若能转悟，则同如来。”就看我们愿不愿意放下虚妄本无的妄想。分别执着。古语云：“放下屠刀，立地成佛。”屠刀所说的就是妄想、分别、执着。一念彻底觉悟，真正放下，凡夫一念之间就成佛。如善财童子。六祖慧能大师
都是真正的实力。佛在哪里？佛就是我们自己。永嘉大师云：“梦里明明有六趣，绝后空空无大千。”梦中凡夫面对善恶境界，真有苦乐感受。这是因为不觉迷惑而虚妄受苦、冤枉受的。佛菩萨也有善恶境界，但是他觉悟了，所以没有喜忧苦乐的感受。心地永远清净光明。佛知道一切众生本来是佛，自然平等恭敬一切众生，与诸佛毫无差别。众生不明白事实真相，所以见到佛都是凡夫，轻慢自大。这一念轻慢，就是凡夫习气，就是妄想执着，把我们自性本具的圆满智慧、神通、道力盖覆住了。唯有至诚、恭敬、谦虚、和善、仁慈、博爱，才是一切众生自性本具的。圆满善德，让我们从此时此刻，真正放下一切妄想、分别、执着，恢复自信、本具、善德、美好，让和谐世界从我心做起。静空老教授在联谊活动中表示，大家能齐聚一堂，参与联合国欢庆未赛节的活动，是非常难得的因缘，并且说到，如果我们能够把四桩事情做好，世界就和平了。第一个，国家跟国家要平等对待，和睦相处。第二个。足以影响这个世界安全的大的政党，派系，应该要放弃自己个人的这个小党派的利益，要为国家福祉、为世界人民福祉去着想。第三个，就是族群跟族群的和睦。第四个，是宗教跟宗教的和睦。各宗教互相尊重，然后互相学习，如此伦理、道德、因果与宗教教育，必能相辅相成，真正实践“爱心变世界，善意满人间”的和谐社会。活动中，特别举行传灯仪式。灯在佛门中代表智慧，代表燃烧自己，照亮别人，更是蕴含着薪火相传、永不止息的深远意义。来自世界各国的法师与贵宾，用真诚的心点亮了每一盏慈悲智慧之灯，共同祈祷世界和平。欢庆二五五零年未赛节活动圆满结束了，整个活动的宗旨以推动伦理道德教育、化解冲突，以宗教团结，带动多元文化族群和谐，促进社会安定，世界和平之路正需要我们大家手牵手、心连心，共同向前走。
结束了获益良多的法国之行，净空老法师一行人应邀前往著名历史哲学家汤恩比教授的故乡——英国，继续推广佛陀至善圆满的多元文化社会教育的弘法行程。净空老法师一行抵达英国伦敦的当晚，应邀参与当地同修举办的欢迎晚宴。晚宴开始，由伦敦大学联合会佛学社社长、英国佛教教育基金会会长，以及英国佛教教育基金会董事，代表英国的佛教团体，欢迎老法师一行来到英国弘法。在净空老法师开示之后，蔡礼旭老师为在场的同修们讲授《幸福人生讲座》《弟子规》。演讲中，蔡老师与在场的同修们分享了在庐江教学的心得。这是净空老法师第二次应邀到伦敦大学亚非学院参访，并发表演说。老法师非常推崇伦敦大学对中华文化的研究，也谈到这次前往法国参加联合国首次宗教活动的意义和感想，强调世出世间道德学术的成就，必须特别重视基础。如果仅止于学术研究，终究无法领会圣哲，学而时习之，不亦乐乎的人生至乐。第一次，教科文组织的总部通知我，啊，希望我参加这次活动，啊，而且邀请我做主办单位，啊，我非常欢喜，我就答应了。有些人问我，他说：“法师，你办这个这么大的活动，你的目的在哪里？你的用用意在哪里？”我说：“有，我有目的，啊，我也有，我也有用意。”我说：“两桩事情，第一个。”我们新加坡现在是十个宗教啊，上了联合国的这个呃这个呃大的大会堂啊，互相在在在一起为世界和平祈祷，告诉大家世界宗教大家。第二个呢，他们是这个还不到一年，我们教学的成果啊，就是真正化解冲突，落实社会的。安定和平啊，也是中国领导人呢最近提出来的和谐社会、和谐世界，我们可以把它落实啊。这不是空洞的口号，这个我在联合国告诉全世界的人，这个事情可以做到啊。所以我办这个这次的活动，主要的目的在此。Friends House 是欧洲著名的和平殿堂。许多曾为世界和平而努力的伟大人物，像是甘地等人，都在这个地方发表过演讲。这次净空老法师也应邀在这儿演讲。讲演首晚，主持人首先礼请老法师致辞，再请蔡礼旭老师讲授《幸福人生讲座》《弟子规》。所以中国讲正极坏，这个化，自然而然的感化。绝对不是去强迫，给自己真正做好，自自然然影响家人，影响身旁。听完蔡老师的幸福讲座，在场的人无不觉得受益良多。而英国弘法第二天的行程，也在蔡老师精彩的演讲下圆满的结束。第三天一大早，老法师一行前往剑桥大学参观。并且与东亚研究所的麦大维教授和研究生交流，这些西方的学者们与中国历史文化各有专精，并且以流利的汉语交谈提问，令老法师一行倍感亲切，却也是感触良深。今天从孟子的时代，讲讲仁义，不能强利欲，利物
，是是是一种社会的动荡的根源。啊，这个仁义才是是这个世界安定的基础。啊，现在大家不讲仁义。都讲厉害，这个问题也多。不但社会混乱，连我们整个学术的时候都被误导。啊，就我们这个这几这些年来的时候，非常认真的也提倡这个根扎根的教育啊，儒释道三家的根，我们要重视的。你有根呢，它是好的，像树木一样，它有根。虽然现在不好看，它小的树苗啊，它慢慢会长大。啊，他会开花结果。如果说我们根本有了，但是从上面来研究过去这东西，像画纸插的画一样，很美丽，很好看的，它是死，它不是活的。啊，所以今天扎根的教育，才能够拯救这个世界，才能够化解冲突。随后，净空老法师引剑桥大学、东亚研究所。与剑桥大学佛学社之请，在校内以佛陀教育与净土宗为题发表演说，特别强调佛学、儒学与学佛学儒的不同。唯有于日常生活工作、处事待人接物中，真正效法圣贤，从自己内心化解对一切人事物的对立、矛盾、冲突。才能领会法喜充满的真实意。那么，一般世间人追求世间的名闻利养、荣华富贵，好像看起来生活很富裕，有权有势有财富，好像很快乐。那个乐中有真苦，啊，苦中有乐，乐中有苦。希望大家要好好记住。结束了在剑桥大学的参访行程，净空老法师当晚就在 Friends House， 以佛陀的教育从自信平和到世界和平为题演讲。烦恼啊，这个这个这个情绪本来没有啊，既然迷惑啊，烦恼情绪本来没有，当然可以放下。那么，既然是真诚、清净、平等、正觉慈悲是本来有的，我们肯定可以恢复。所有冲突的根本，都在于自信与习性的冲突。佛说“境随心转”，必须从自己内心深处放下贪、嗔、痴三毒，才能够化解所有的矛盾冲突、天灾人祸，恢复社会安定、世界和平。